Good evening, everyone, and welcome to uh, what should be a quite a fascinating and glorious evening here at the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum at the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have you here for tonight's uh, Wiener Lecture. The Wiener Lecture was established in 1989 by Malcolm Wiener, who's here. I'll mention something about him in a moment, uh, because it's one of the many interests of Malcolm Wiener. The scholarship, it's, it's uh, focused on international financial manager, matters, including currency and international monetary systems. Hard to imagine a better speaker for that broad topic. And indeed, recent lectures have included Pete Peterson, Pascal Lamy, Mohamed Yunus, Gordon Brown, and Jean-Claude Trichet. Now, the man behind this lecture is uh, here with us, as I mentioned, as is his uh, wife, Carolyn, and his daughter, Elizabeth, who's uh, recently started the college. Now, this is not a term I use very readily at all, but Malcolm is actually a Renaissance man. Um, he, he is a historian. He's a, a political economist. Uh, he is. He started out um, uh, d doing a variety of different things. He's. This is someone who's primarily now a historian and a um, uh, is 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 someone who's whose uh, publications focus on the rise, fluorescence, and collapse of civilizations in the third and second centuries B.C.E. Millennia. Sorry, I said um, millennia. Whatever. Uh, <laughs> in the Aegean, Near Eastern, and Egyptian world. So it just shows that I am not a Renaissance man, but he is. But this is also a man who early on in his career, uh, working with a colleague, figured out that mathematics could be very usefully applied to the study of markets and investing and so forth, and was very successful at that. He also spent a period of his life working in social policy and indeed figured out and thought about strategies for effective training uh, for young people. Um, and indeed has been quite involved with the Kennedy School in various settings. Um, he is the person who was behind the creation of the Malcolm Wiener Center for Social Policy. Indeed, he's endowed a number of lectures here. I myself have been a Malcolm Wiener uh, lecturer. Um, he has gotten uh, doctorates and honorary doctorates from a variety of universities like the University of Sheffield, Eckerd Carle University, the University of Athens, uh, University College London, Dickinson. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Sciences, the Society of Antiquar Antiquaries in London, member of the Royal Swedish Academy, History and Antiques, uh, and a variety of others that I can't say because I don't speak the languages. Um, He's well known in Greece, and uh, he holds the Ring of Honor and uh, the Academy de Visions. Well, forget it. I'm hopeless. Um, but the bottom line is, this is a man who cares deeply about everything from international e economics to poverty in the streets, and so it's it's terrific to have a lecturer that he's endowed in his name uh, doing. Uh, and we're very very fortunate to have him here today. So. Um, by the way, uh, our speaker today is going to be introduced by Larry Summers, but I should mention one thing about him. He has been at Harvard, as has Malcolm, by the way, who's done some teaching here, as an Institute of Politics fellow uh, in 2001. So there are various connections. Now, I'm going to turn it over to Larry Summers to introduce him. Let me just say a couple words about Larry Summers. Larry is uh, someone who indeed needs no introduction. He's been involved in everything from the, he's been the chief economist of the World Bank, uh, he's been a treasury secretary, he's been uh, the president of Harvard University, uh, he's been the head of the National Economic Council. Uh, indeed, wherever economic challenges have uh, existed, he's often been at the forefront of trying to solve those problems, uh, find ways, find solutions to those problems and the like. He's, he is now and has been for some time uh, a, a university professor based here at the Kennedy School, and he is the head of our uh, most of our Romani uh, Center for Business and Government. So uh, I can think of no better person to provide an introduction to tonight's speaker than the Charles uh, W. Eliot uh, University Professor Lawrence Summers. David, uh, thank you for those kind words and everything you do as dean uh, to support all of us. Malcolm and Carolyn, uh, thank you for 
this lecture series, which is enormously important uh, to uh, this community. I am delighted to have the opportunity to in introduce uh, my good friend, Mario Draghi. I know of no finer, more dedicated, more honest, and more able public servant than Mario Draghi. I met Mario Draghi for the first time more than 20 years ago when he served as an executive director at the World Bank and I was the chief economist of the World Bank. It was my great privilege to work closely with him for the six and a half years that I served as a G7 uh, deputy and he served as the G7 deputy representing Italy. My whole job was managing the international relations of uh, the Treasury for much of that time. Mario's job was managing the international relations of the Italian Treasury and also managing almost everything else that took place at uh, the Italian Treasury. And somehow he always seemed better briefed and better informed than I was for all of our conversations. I was struck by the remarkable facility with which he moved behind, between quoting the professors who had taught him on his way to an MIT PhD and understanding uh, the darkest interstices of Italian politics without ever having any mud stick uh, to him. It was a remarkable demonstration of a powerful intellect harnessed to enormous uh, practical, uh, be practical benefit. Mario served uh, until 2001 as the director of the Italian uh, Treasury. Like so many uh, ex-public officials or recently retired uh, public officials, Mario then found himself a fellow at uh, the Institute of Politics, as David has already mentioned. He then spent uh, several years in a crucial role overseeing European operations at uh, Goldman Sachs before being called back to serve as the governor of the Central Bank of uh, Italy. Subsequent uh, to that, at a moment of extraordinary challenge, Mario Draghi was named as the third head of the European Central Bank. Those who follow European affairs will be aware that it was something less than entirely intuitive to appoint an Italian as the head of the European Central Bank with responsibility for <coughs> managing the uh, affairs, uh, the monetary affairs of Europe. One theory as to why it happened, I suppose, was that there was enough foresight to realize that the problem would be deflation rather than inflation. That is not the right theory for why Mario Draghi was selected. Mario Draghi was selected because his reputation for strength character and competence, competence transcended individual country loyalties. And there was a confidence throughout Europe that come what may, Mario Draghi would be up to uh, the job. He has done many important things during his time as head of the ECB. I venture to say as a close and relatively well-informed observer that if someone else had been head of the ECB, there might well today 
not be a uh, euro. Churchill famously made an observation about never have so many owed so much to so few. Roughly in the same spirit, I would say that never in the history of banking have so few words and so little action been as remarkably efficacious in saving a continent as when Mario Draghi ad-libbed into a speech a little more than a year ago these words, within our mandate, the ECB is ready to do whatever it takes to preserve the euro. And believe me, it will be enough. Those are not the words of a foggy central banker trying to kind of create Delphic confusion. Those are the words of a determined and clear-minded public servant who Europe has been fortunate to have at the helm of its monetary affairs. Mario Draghi. Thank you. Well, let me first thank all of you for this uh, warm welcome, and especially you, Larry, for the uh, fantastic introduction. I'm, uh, I'm quite, uh, uh, I don't know, I'm just, <laughs> I felt too, it was too much for me. Anyway, <laughs> I have several reasons to be grateful for this invitation today. Uh, one is uh, that uh, certainly I'm honored by this invitation, by the prestige of this lecture. But the other uh, is that I'm, it took me back here in Cambridge, where I spent uh, probably the happiest time of my life. And uh, also, and that's the third reason, as it was said, I was OEP, IOP fellow in 2001. So it's like coming back again to a very, uh, a very I wouldn't say happy, because the situation was quite dramatic at that time certainly one of the most filling experiences of, of my life. Uh, incidentally, I was asked to uh, teach a course, and I was asked what I was going to teach on. And uh, I thought that a good theme would be the functioning of the uh, European Union. And after a couple of classes, I realized the immense boredom <laughs> that was, <laughs> was just falling on on the students, and, and so I had to change, basically, in a, quite suddenly, the list of things that I was going to discuss. Now, I'm confident that since then, uh, either because the challenges have become bigger and bigger, uh, and or because we actually managed to make some progress, what I'm going to say today, tonight, is just slightly less boring than what I was going to teach about uh, almost 10, 12 years ago. Um, the, the United States has often been described as a young nation, but the institution that I am the honor to chair uh, is an even younger institution, as well as the whole European construction. The European Central Bank and the single currency began operations nearly 15 years ago, at the beginning of 99. Today, I would like to give you a flavor of both the circumstances of our beginnings and the challenging environment of our teenage years. Also like to do an exercise in perspective that while uh, showing the complexities of our endeavor, uh, at the same time will give you a sense of progress that's been achieved so far. Europe is currently engaged in a far reaching process of reform. Many of those reforms are taking place within the member states of the European Union to make their public finances more sustainable, to make their economies more competitive, and to strengthen the balance sheets of their domestic banks. But there is also an important stream of reforms taking place at the European level. The counterpart of what you call the federal level here in the United States New rules and institutions are being created that will change the relationship between the Union and the Member States. It is this process and its implications on which I want to focus on my remarks today. The preamble of the European Treaty makes 
quote, ever closer union, unquote, a goal of the European Union. For some people, this creates anxiety. It seems to promise an inexorable movement towards a future super state. Many Europeans with different national histories and cultures feel that they are not ready for that. So it's important to understand that the agenda facing Europe today is not adequately captured by the phrase ever closer union. In my view, it's better encapsulated by wording borrowed from the Constitution of the United States, the establishment of a more perfect union. By this, I mean that we are perfecting something that has already begun, namely the economic and monetary union that was launched in 1999. Policymakers are following through the consequences of this decision to create a genuine single market supported by single currency. In what follows, I'd like to describe several of those consequences. And in doing so, I will explore two broad themes. First, I will argue that a single market necessarily has po political implications in which a partial sharing of individual and national sovereignty can be the best means to preserve that sovereignty. Second, I will explain the concepts of banking union and a strengthened fiscal setup is supportive of the single market and the single currency. To understand the European Union and the Euro area, it's important to appreciate the difference between a free trade area and a true single market. A free trade area is a partial and reversible arrangement. A single market, by contrast, is a universal and permanent union. This is a distinction with fundamental implications. Because a single market is universal and permanent, governments and parliaments forfeit, both in principle and by treaty, the ability to reinstate border controls. This means that, unlike in a free trade area, they cannot act alone to protect their constituents from unfair or unlawful competition from abroad. Yet, such underpinning at political level is vital for a market to function. There can't be a free market without such fundamental elements of law as the protection of property rights and the enforcement of contracts. So while a free trade area can be managed through intergovernmental cooperation, a single market requires a supranational organization. There has to be a judiciary with the power to enforce competition law at the level of the market. In Europe, this authority is devolved to the European Commission and the European Court of Justice. If there is a judiciary, there naturally has to be a legislature to write the law enforced by the judiciary. In Europe, the European Council and the European Parliament jointly perform this role. And if there is a legislature and a judiciary, then there is also to be an executive able to implement their decisions. Again, in Europe, the European Commission is entrusted with executive responsibility. This is what I mean when I say the single market necessarily has political implications. Indeed, it is well known that the short commerce clause of the Constitution of the United States, which grants Congress power to regulate commerce among the several states, forms the basis of a considerable body of federal legislation governing economic matters in this country. The more difficult question in Europe is what degree of powers must be transferred to the supranational level to support the single market? Or put differently, how much sovereignty needs to be shared? In my view, one way to approach this question is by considering more carefully what we mean by sovereignty. One way to look at sovereignty is normative and, what, and, and was historically favored by absolutists such as Jean Baudin in the 16th century. Sovereignty here is defined in relation to rights, the right to declare war and treat the conditions of the peace, to raise taxes, to mint money, and to judge in last resort. 
Another way to look at it is positive. Sovereignty relates to the ability to deliver in practice the essential services that people expect from government. A sovereign that is not capable of effectively discharging its mandate would be sovereign only in name. This second approach is more consistent with the writings of the political philosophers who most influenced our modern democracies. John Locke, in his second treatise of government, affirms that the sovereign exists only as a fiduciary power to act for certain ends. It is the ability to achieve those ends that defines and legitimizes sovereignty. The same argument is made by James Madison in Federalist Paper 45, in which he states that no form of government whatsoever, whatever, has any other value than as it may be fitted for the attainment of the public good. I see this positive view as essentially the right way to think about sovereignty. And I think it needs to be the guiding principle when deciding which powers should be at national or European levels. We need to look at effectiveness, not at abstract principles that may be empty in today's world. Such an approach moves us away from a zero-sum view of sovereignty as power, where one body loses sovereignty and another gains it. Instead, by placing the needs of citizens at the center, it allows us to view sovereignty in terms of outcomes, and this can be positive sum. This way of thinking is, in fact, already embedded in the EU treaty under the principle of subsidiarity. This states that powers cannot be transferred to the level of the Union, the equivalent of the federal level, unless action is more effective at that level than at a lower level of government. In other words, it places the emphasis squarely on the efficacy of policy. In my view, this is this pragmatic focus on policy efficacy that should be the motor of further integration. Policy effectiveness was indeed one of the, many, the main motivations for monetary union, in particular to maximize the potential gains from member states forming a single market. A first argument in favor of a single currency related to the desirability of a single means of payment and unit of account in a single market. A single currency is not necessary for trade but it's helpful to the extent it eliminates currency conversion costs and increases price transparency. A second argument related to the conditions for fair competition in a single market. In a system of floating exchange rates like we had after the collapse of the Smithsonian agreements in 1971, if I believe, correctly, if I remember correctly, in a system of floating exchange rates, individual governments may be tempted to manipulate their currency to pursue beggar thy neighbor policies, which they did, by the way, which constitutes a distortion of competition. An economy that increases productivity and competitiveness can be deprived of the benefits it should enjoy in terms of increased market share because of currency depreciation in competing, current, in competing countries. Indeed, the Instability of exchange rates post Bretton Woods has vindicated the views of economists, who, such as Ragnar Nurks, who in a study in 1944 warned of the economic losses stemming from currency volatility. Uh, it is also worth remembering that Nobel laureate Robert Mandel developed his theory of an optimum currency area as a critique of flexible exchange rates in a single market. He said that he could not see why countries that were in the process of forming a common market should saddle themselves with a new barrier to trade in the form of uncertainty about exchange rates. In any case, the desire to limit exchange rate volatility in the EU was formulated very soon after the collapse of the Bretton Woods. It has been reflected in successive fixed exchange rate arrangements, and it has been reflected in the treaty requirement that each member state treat its exchange rate policy as a matter of common interest. But let's see what happened. 
free trade and capital movements could clearly not, to be, sac not be sacrificed in a true single market. Also, Europeans saw fixed exchange rates as an important component of fair competition. It was then the national sovereignty over monetary policies that would have to be sacrificed. In this sense, the single currency became a way of maximizing the benefits of the single market. And the empirical evidence suggests that sharing a currency has indeed boosted trade, although the effect may be smaller than was earlier suggested. Let me also add that for several member states, joining the single currency implied not only greater policy efficacy, but paradoxically greater national influence. Whether Austria before 1999 or Latvia today, many member states pursued a fixed exchange rate policy or a currency board vis-a-vis -a, -vis a bigger neighbor, Germany in the past, the euro area today. This meant that they were effectively importing a monetary policy over which they had no say. Now, as members of the euro area, they have a say. When Latvia will adopt the euro on January 1st next year, my colleague, the governor of the Central Bank of Lat Latvia, will partake fully in the formulation of the ECB's monetary policy. The same cannot be said of the countries that peg their currencies to the US dollar, some of which are considerably larger. The implications of the decision to set up a genuine single market are not limited to the creation of the single currency. The single currency itself has consequences of which the most pressing is a banking union. The establishment of a banking union was agreed by the head states of go and government in Europe and is now being delivered in stages, starting with a single supervisory mechanism. Now, the single supervisory mechanism is equivalent to uh, your New York Fed when we will have built it. And this has been entrusted to the ECB and it's recently been approved by the European Parliament. We also trust that the single resolution mechanism, like your FDIC, will enter into force by the beginning of 2015. To understand why banking union is a consequence of a monetary union, it is worth recalling that only a small fraction of money is outside money, meaning the liability of the central bank. The bulk of money used in the economy is inside money, meaning the liability of a commercial bank. The, for money to be truly single, within a currency area, there has to be full substitutability between its different forms. This means that one euro in a bank in any euro area country has to be fully substitutable with a euro in another member country. And the only way to achieve this is to remove the differences in the banking system that can create fragmentation along national lines. And the most important difference is the way banks are supervised and, when necessary, are resolved by national authorities. We are thus moving these functions to the European level to ensure that single currency is matched by a single banking system. And this is consistent with the positive definition of sovereignty I gave earlier. A genuine banking union can give citizens more trust in their money than can different national approaches. Moreover, there is an important positive feedback effect here. While there is a chain of logic from the single market to the single currency to banking union, banking union in turn supports the single market. When fragmentation of the banking system takes place, as uh, it is at the present time, it does not only undermine the singleness of money, but it also undermines the conditions of competition. And this is because it results in a dispersion of bank lending rates among national lines. Let me be clear here. There is no reason per se why a Spanish firm should be able to borrow at exactly the same rate as a Dutch firm. If the operating environment of both firms is different, then this can reasonably affect their credit risk and therefore the rate at which they borrow. 
But in a single market, a Spanish firm should be able to borrow from a Spanish bank at the same rate at which it would borrow from a Dutch bank. If that's not the case, if the risk premium paid by a bank client in one country is not idiosyncratic but systemic, then there, is, there no longer truly is a single market for capital. Location would matter. And this is what banking union aims to reverse. In Europe, such banking union is even more important than the United States because over two thirds of firms' external financing takes place in the form of bank loans. For small and medium sized enterprises, this share is even higher. In the US, by contrast, the role of banks in firms' external finance is only about one third or even less. Hence, the banking union is crucial also for the euro area real economy. But it can reasonably be asked if a banking union is so important, why did this only become apparent in the last few years? The main reason is that the potential for financial fragmentation in the euro area was not recognized. Policymakers and observers didn't fully appreciate the extent to which diverging fundamentals between different economies could feed through to the banking system. This applies notably to sovereign debt and the two-way interaction between sovereign distress and bank distress. Certainly a banking union can play a major role in breaking the vicious circle we see in Europe between banks and their sovereigns today. But it's also a strong onus on governments to ensure that sovereign debt performs its expected function in the financial system, that is, as a risk-free, safe asset. Let me therefore briefly turn to fiscal policies here. It is welcome that governments in the euro area have made significant progress in consolidating their budgets and hence removing some sovereign risk from the financial system. The primary fiscal deficit for the euro area has fallen from 3.5% of GDP in 2009 to around 0.5% in 2012. Just to give you a sense of comparison, in the United States, it was around 6% of GDP in 2012. That said, we need to ensure time consistency. We all know the experience of the first decade of the euro. Fiscal rules enshrined in the Maastricht Treaty were not sufficiently binding. Market discipline, likewise, did not work in an effective way. For this reason, the ECB has long argued in favor of moving towards more effective rules in the fiscal domain. We are convinced that they are crucial for the stability of the common currency in the longer term. So I'm quite encouraged now that policymakers in Europe have un actually undertaken significant steps in this direction. The, all these changes, to some extent, represent a transfer of powers to the European level. But as with the banking union, I do not view it as a loss of sovereignty. Rather, I see the strengthening of the fiscal pillar in a manner that lends credibility to fiscal policies as a way to restore the efficacy of policy. For the Union as a whole, as countries are less affected by spillovers from fiscal difficulties in integrated financial markets and also for member states themselves. The budget stabilization capacity through the automatic stabilizers is diminished if governments are unable to run a deficit at the low point of the cycle. Or put differently, if the credit of the government deteriorates to the point where its debt is no longer regarded as a safe asset. Indeed, if the credit of the government is impaired and behaves like private credit, then the government's relative cost of borrowing increases at precisely the time when it needs to borrow. One can see this as the real loss of sovereignty. It prevents national governments from using normal fiscal policy for macroeconomic stabilization. In this sense, steps that restore faith in public credit, such as more credible fiscal rules, restore the ability of governments to exercise the functions that citizens expect from them. This is 
especially important in the monetary union, where the burden of macroeconomic stabilization cannot be shifted onto the shoulders of the central bank in our monetary union. Our monetary policy mandate is to deliver medium-term price stability in the euro area as a whole. Fiscal policy has to absorb idiosyncratic or asymmetric shocks at national level. And unlike in the United States, as fiscal policies are decentralized, such stabilization takes place entirely at sub-federal or national level in the euro area. However, if the fiscal rules and institutions are credible, there is ample scope for national policies to perform this role. Overall, the changes taking place in euro area are making our monetary union more robust. At the national level, consolidation and structural reforms are helping most countries reach a, most, a more sustainable external position. Our union was not meant to uh, have countries that are permanent creditors and countries that are permanent debtors. So it's only through increasing competitiveness in each country that these positions could rotate, could change. In this sense, our monetary union is profoundly different from what you have in the United States. Uh, that said, it would seem misplaced to exclude that over time, the euro area may move to a new equilibrium. Integration is a dynamic process, and we need a certain degree of humility about where it will lead. If we look at the United States, we see that it strengthened its union in different stages, with each stage eventually begetting the next. The creation of the Federal Reserve System in 1913, for example, was followed 20 years later by the creation of the FDIC. The federal budget also developed significantly at this time. In Europe today, we are in some ways undergoing an analogous process. It's not analogous in the sense that the destination is the same. We do not know this. What is analogous is the guiding principle. Like the US, our orientation is pragmatic and driven by a desire for policy effectiveness and to provide the function citizens expect of a government. We're then drawing the policy conclusions that follow at the time when they are relevant. In, uh, in the dark days of the crisis, many commentators on this side of the Atlantic looked at the Euro area and were convinced it would fail. They were wrong in their medium term macro view after all, if we just go back a few years, we see the euro area has created 600,000 more jobs than in the US since 1999. And while the unemployment rate has increased more in the euro area than certainly here during the crisis, the employment rate in the US has fallen further than in the euro area, which makes the figures difficult to compare. But I think they were wrong in a more fundamental way. They vastly underestimated the depth of Europeans' commitment to the euro. They mistook the euro for fixed exchange rate regime, when in fact it is an irreversible single currency. And it is reversible because it's born out of the commitment of European nations to closer integration, a commitment which as the Nobel Committee recognized last year, has roots in our desire for peace, security, and transcending national differences. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Draghi. Uh, many, many interesting things to think about here. So uh, as is our style, we have time now for open questions from the audience. We have microphones in four locations, one right here, one there, one up there, and one here. We'll just go around in order. 
Uh, let me remind all of you what is a characteristic of a good question at the Kennedy School, indeed, of an acceptable question. You should start by identifying yourself. Uh, second, you should keep it short and it should contain but one thought. And third, it should end with a question mark. Um, and so with that, let me just start right over here. Hi, my name is Ian Van Wy, and I'm a student at Harvard College. Uh, I had a question about how you would uh, sort of deal with maybe conflicting national identities and any proposed sort of, you know, in the European Banking Union. I mean, for instance, we can look at the example of sort of the antagonism between Greece and Germany today, and I was just wondering how you would propose that the European Banking Union address such issues. Well, the first thing is not to ignore these differences. The, uh, there has been, a, uh, I would say, a trend for many years uh, which said, no, they don't matter. Uh, now we learn that they do matter, and they have to be addressed in the proper way. And um, to some extent, the very large imbalances that were uh, that came out after the crisis showed these differences in, uh, I would say, lifestyles. And um, they are being corrected, and people learn. It's quite clear, in a sense, this drives me back to what I was saying before, it's quite clear that our union cannot be a union where countries are permanent debtors. It's, uh, it's not yet at that stage. The creditors are not willing to support forever debtors, especially because the debtors are not their country citizens. Having said that, an enormous effort has been undertaken by all countries in one way or another, by the creditors, countries, uh, efforts, financial efforts have been undertaken, but also by the debtor countries. Uh, the, I mean, if you look at what is the situation today in terms of uh, progress on economic policy with, uh, and you compare it with what uh, it was a year ago, progress is staggering. Countries like Greece, in countries like Spain, Portugal, Ireland, you see that all of them now have uh, trade and current account surpluses, some, in some cases very significant. Uh, unit labor costs, which used to grow way more than uh, Germany and so on, now they are going down, while in Germany are going up. And this is what we call rebalancing. So they are being addressed. Right up here. Um, my name is Konstantinos Papalukas. Uh, I'm a student in um, HKS. Um, Mr. President, one of the main tasks of the ECB and the European Systemic Risk Board is to promote financial stability through macroprudential supervision. In the case of Cyprus, after the March 2013 events, <coughs> the two largest banks of the country, which were considered as systemic at the time, have been placed in a resolution procedure. After fierce pressure and guidance by the Troika, the Central Bank of Cyprus has finally finished the resolution of the two banks by July 2013. The result was essentially a takeover of the second largest bank by the largest bank, taking with, all, with it all the liabilities except from the insured deposits. The resulting bank, which was created after the resolution, however, is now more systemic than the previous two and bigger than big to fail. Moreover, this bank now carries the heavy burden of the emergency liquidity assistance that the other bank was provided with and all its loan portfolio, which mainly consists of non-performing loans. Considering the fact that the macroeconomic environment will be further aggra aggravated in the coming years due to the Troika program and the fact that investors have lost their trust in the Cypriot banking system, one can suggest that this monster bank, which was created by the Troika in cooperation with the Central Bank Is of Cyprus... Is there a question there? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm coming How about right this second, yeah. the question? It's doomed to fail and take with it to the ground the whole of the Cypriot economy, or what's left. Uh, my question is, how could the European Central Bank, whose one of the main tasks is to promote financial stability in the Eurozone, go against its own objectives and be responsible for the building up of systemic risks in a Eurozone country, which is already at the brink of economic collapse? Could that be considered as carelessness of the part of the ECB and the Troika, or that it was intentional since Cyprus does not pose any contagion threats to the rest of the Eurozone. If this is so, is it fair for the citizens of Cyprus? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Now, the uh, Cyprus experience, as we all know, 
has been a very difficult one to, uh, to, to handle. And um, one of the reasons was that uh, when banks fail, uh, they first, you first exhaust the, uh, you first bail in the shareholders, then there are several categories of creditors, and then you have depositors. In the case of these two banks, you had no other, no significant other creditors than depositors. So the depositors, the unsecured depositors, the uninsured depositors, had to be bailed in. And this was a precedent for uh, the whole of the euro area, and it was certainly a traumatic experience. Let me say that Cyprus was pretty unique because the banking system of Cyprus was 650 times its GDP. <laughs> so uh, that it was not certainly fault of the ECB or fault of the European Union. That was basically how the country had grown. And uh, it was pretty clear at the time when the system collapsed that uh, uh, two banks were too much, and so one was closed. Now the other one has absorbed, but not necessarily will end up being bigger than previously. Not necessarily. Also, I'm not sure that markets have certainly lost trust at the beginning, but what we are seeing today actually is that this trust is gradually coming back. And of course it will continue to come back with the reforms efforts that the Cypriot government has started. So um, all in all, I'm slightly, I think, more confident than, than you are as far as the future of Cyprus is concerned. Thank you very much. Right over here. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for uh, the lecture. Yeah. My name is John Soilu. I am a junior at the college, and I wanted to ask a question on behalf of the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum Committee. Um, you talked a little bit about the uh, fiscal um, consolidation within the EU, and I believe the Growth and Stability Pact has very sort of clear guidelines about, you know, 3% of the GDP for the debt, uh, sorry, for the deficit and 60% for uh, overall debt. Uh, but there have been criticisms about the fact that the EU might not have been in a position to fully enforce these. And uh, there have been ideas of, of, of reforms, but they haven't been enacted. Uh, can you enlighten us about how, um, what should be done, basically, and, and when can we expect to see those uh, stronger sort of enforcement mechanisms um, in terms of fiscal uh, discipline? Yeah, well, several changes. We, we, we're all aware that the previous uh, rules of the Stability and Growth Pact uh, had been uh, undermined by the experiences in 2004 and 5. And uh, so the rules that were enshrined in the Maastricht Treaty first and then Stability and Growth Pact next had lost any binding power. So the uh, year 2012 has seen big changes in these rules, especially through the provision of, uh, especially through two channels. First of all, the provisions that these rules, new rules, would, would uh, entail, the 3%, the uh, balanced budget under certain circumstances, would be introduced in the constitution of the different member states. Second channel was the attribution to the European Commission of the power to, I would say, I would use the word, inspect the budget of each member state before this budget would be discussed by its national parliament. And, uh, and third, there was a new procedure called the macroeconomic imbalances procedure whereby the commission would assess uh, the action that each country is undertaking in uh, uh, as far as their structural reforms are concerned. And whether the present situation is one of uh, serious imbalances that could actually prejudge the stability of the euro area. So there were significant actions taken towards uh, this, uh, this uh, objective. But you certainly appreciate in terms of the language I used before that um, uh, subsidiarity, as far as budgetary matters is concerned, is moving, at least until now, is moving along this line of new rules inserted in the Constitution, attribution of powers to supranational entities, but not yet creating a federal budget. 
And over here. Oh, thank you, Dr. Draghi. Uh, my name is Sita Gopard. I'm a junior at the college. Um, and as a European, of course, it's a great honor for me to, to hear you speak and for all of us, of course. Um, you talked a lot about the progress the Eurozone has made in strengthening its monetary union uh, as well as its common market. I wanted to ask you about uh, the future of, of Europe and your vision particularly. What do you think are the next steps towards um, strengthening integration within the Eurozone and or within the EU as a whole? Um, and in 10 or 20 years, what is your vision for uh, the EU? Well, it's, uh, it's kind of hard to to imagine what's going to happen, but uh, I can make reference to the uh, what's called the Four Presidents Report that was presented in uh, the European Council of June last year and uh, was approved by the European leaders. This report is the first presentation of what the Union might become in the future. And there we have uh, a basically an economic union, a banking union, and a fiscal union and a political union. So the four steps are illustrated. Now, although we have now a pretty, uh, a pretty precise idea of what a, a, a banking union is, because we are moving, we're moving towards these, the establishment of these three steps that I mentioned before, the single supervision, the single resolution authority, and ultimately some form of deposit insurance at European level. And we know what the economic union is uh, in the sense that more and more the undertaking of structural reforms cannot be left entirely to national governments, but has to be either through peer pressure or through explicit coordination be undertaken more uh, at, the, uh, at, the European, at the European level. Uh, I often say that while we have a fairly developed uh, discipline, set of discipline for the, budgetary, for the budgetary area, we don't have any discipline for the structural reforms. Each country deals with the reform of their competition or their labor markets in its own national way. And that's certainly not the way to go. That has to change. So uh, we have, we also, um, on the fiscal union, uh, the thing becomes more difficult to specify because it's quite clear that fiscal, if fiscal union means the following, I issue a new pay, this is not gonna work. So uh, there has to be trust, first and foremost. In order, because trust wasn't there, certainly before the, what was, wasn't there, isn't here yet. Trust can be achieved through a system of strict compliance with rules. And then we can start thinking about the fiscal union in the way you would consider it in this country. Now, the political union is even vaguer, in a sense. We, we, don't, we, we know that that's going to be a step in the future but we don't have a precise view uh, of what this is going to be. Thank you. Right over here. <clears throat> Hi, Dr. Draghi. Takoa De Silva, thank you for taking my question. Um, what are your thoughts on gold as a reserve asset? You have the central banks like China, Russia, increasing their reserves, especially over the last 10 years. Germany, for example, asking for some of their uh, uh, holdings back from New York. It doesn't produce any income, I guess, unless it's leased. Why, why do you think they would want that, and what value does it offer, in your opinion? Well, for, uh, well, for uh, you're also asking this question to someone who's been governor of Bank of Italy. Bank of Italy is the fourth largest uh, owner of gold reserves in the world, which is fairly disproportionate with the size of the country, no? Mm. Uh, and... Uh, but I never thought it wise to sell it, because for central banks, this is a, a reserve of safety. It's viewed by the country as uh, such. In the case of non-dollar countries, it gives you a fairly good protection against the fluctuations of the dollar. So there are several reasons, risk diversification and, and so on. So that's why Central banks, which had started uh, a program for selling gold uh, a few years ago, 
substantially, I think, stopped by and large. They are not selling it any longer. Okay. Also, the experience of some central banks that have liquidated the whole stock of gold uh, about 10 years ago was uh, not uh, considered to be terribly successful from a, from a, a purely money viewpoint. Right here. Hi, my name is Alex Jurgen. I'm a joint student between the Kennedy School and Harvard Business School. Uh, following on previous questions, how important do you think the development of a sort of some form of a common European identity is towards greater integration within the Union, and what path forward do you see for the development of such an identity? I think it's very, very important. I think it's probably the most important thing that we should uh, aim at. As a matter of fact, when, when I was here in 2001, what came out in that dramatic situation is, this, uh, is the fantastic strength that this country has and uh, the capacity to react to such a tragedy and uh, the strong identity in which all of you recognize yourself. And um, so it came to me that I, at that time, I. I wrote a short paper exactly on this point and what's needed to do that. It's a very long process. Uh, it's a very long process that goes through having a common culture, it goes through having uh, labor mobility way higher than what we have today across countries. That uh, goes through having, um, having serious challenges that you end up winning together. In the past, it was often it was wars. Now, I think uh, recessions are somewhat equivalent. I, I, I still remember in about that time, about that time, having a conversation with Professor Stan Fisher and talking about the euro, and he said, "Well, I'm not sure whether the euro will survive, but certainly you're going to be stressed by the next recession. Let's see how it goes through that." So far, we seem to be together. And I think national, th this identity will develop through these challenges. Right over here. Hi, Rachel Brown, LaRouche Policy Institute. Last week, there was a meeting uh, with the White House and Jamie Dimon, several other uh, Wall Street officials, which was essentially to be a, a meeting called to prevent Glass-Steagall. It was an emergency called because there's been massive support for Glass-Steagall in both houses of Congress, both parties. Uh, and putting through Glass-Steagall would prevent the bail-in policy, uh, which is intended being pushed right now by many central bankers around the, the planet and uh, essentially would force through cuts greater than already seen, which are creating mass murder as seen in the life expectancy of Greece, which has been diminished by five years in the last two, two years of budget cuts in Greece. So would you support the Glass-Steagall instead of this intended genocide? <laughs> but what I can say is that having seen what the situation was before the crisis and having worked to produce the uh, first response to the crisis in a report that the FSF, the Financial Stability Forum, was asked to produce in 2008. Uh, what one can safely say is that uh, risks were poorly appreciated, poorly managed, and the response to, to, to these risks when the events materialized by the single banks was bad. Uh, since then, now, I don't know what, I, I wouldn't be able to say how much this was due to the size of the institutions or to the nature of their business models. What was clear was that risk management was most of the time uh, defective, had flaws. Since then, many things have changed. So one has to acknowledge that uh, because, I would say, mostly of the action of regulators, but also because of market discipline, banks have changed, and they do a better job today. Now, let's keep in mind that we'll never be able to avoid 
a crisis because we'll know, we won't know where it will come from. So our actions should be geared to make the system, the financial system, stronger. And uh, I think that's what uh, regulators are doing now. Of course, this goes against the vested interests of the industry sometime. So you have to have a pretty clear sense of the direction if you are a regulator or a central banker or where you want to go for the interest of the society, which not, doesn't necessarily coincide with the interest of the industry. Very good. <clears throat> Mr. Draghi, good evening. My name is Alex. I'm a second year MPA student here at the Kennedy School. Um, I've been in the U.S. for a year, and I've had passionate discussions about Europe with non-European people. And in my view, there are two ways to talk about Europe. One is what you just did, technical, accurate, the what, and the how. My question is the why. And you just said to this gentleman here, our identity will develop through challenges. My proposition is the following. We need an identity to overcome the challenges. It's not true that sorry, challenges... we need an identity? To we need to know who we are to overcome yeah. those challenges. We need to know what it is to be a European. So my question to, to you is that simple. What it is to be a European today? Thank you. There's certainly a question mark at the end of your question. Uh, the, to be... Uh, it's quite... Uh, I think it, our history shows that to be European is beneficial to everybody if you go through the medium term. I'll say something about the present crisis because I don't want to be, uh, I, don't want to be I don't want to sound complacent. But it's quite clear that uh, the, to work together and to decide that certain decisions should be taken at a, higher, at a, at a level higher than single nations has proved to be beneficial. The, I think this is pretty uncontroversial. Then you're asking uh, whether it's through challenges that we come to an identity or, it's, or you need an identity to cope with the challenges. Well, I think it goes really both ways. You are, France is, is able to, uh, was able to cope with certain challenges, a certain historical moment in their history because of the national identity. But when you have uh, problems like that transcend national borders, if you live in a, for example, global capital market, your national identity being French doesn't help much because the powers of the French government or the Italian government or the Spanish government over the borders are nil. The same thing happens with environment and so on. So it's really, uh, you need a larger, a larger uh, reference, geographical reference for coping with these challenges that are often challenges at world level than a single nation state uh, that very often is uh, smaller than most of your states in, uh, in the United States. So I think the, there, I think the time in which national identity is important to cope with the challenges, I wouldn't say it's over, it's almost over. We need, uh, we need the capacity to look beyond our borders. We need the capacity to work with other people who speak different languages. And we all share a certain European identity which goes back in history, which have common values, even though being nation states and being the nation states much older than the states in the United States, these identities, national identities, are not going to disappear through time. They're going to stay. But we have to add to this. We have time for just two more questions right here, and this here, followed by that one. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Dr. Draghi, for this masterly lecture. Uh, my name is Muriel Rouillet, and I teach a class here at HKS on global Europe, which I hope is not boring if only because we had a class on you this Tuesday. Um, I have a general question for you. I would like to, to know what you think the role of an expert, an independent expert such as yourself, should be in a democracy, and to which degree of transparency he or she should be subject. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, I think I can give you an example with, uh, with exactly speaking about central bankers. Central banks are very powerful. Larry quoted an example of a speech I gave in London a year ago, a little more than a year ago. So central banks are very powerful. They are also not elected. So how do we square this from a democratic legitimacy viewpoint? Well, the answer is, is this. Central banks are very powerful, but they have to act within a mandate. And Larry was uh, actually careful about saying something that very often people forget about that sentence. We will do whatever it takes within our mandate. And the mandate is basically written and legislated by the legislators, not by the central banks. That's why I, I never, I mean, I usually never answer questions when they ask me, do you prefer a dual mandate rather than price stability mandate? I say, it's not my task to decide about this. And, uh, and then the central bank is powerful, not elected, but only if it acts within the mandate is credible. And uh, credibility is essential for monetary policy. So you see that democratic legitimacy, credibility, and effectiveness of the policy are all intertwined. Thank you. I'm afraid this will have to be the last question. Mr. President, thank you for your lecture. My name is Yelena. I work for Russian government, uh, Territorial Development Ministry. And I have a question about the plans of Ukraine to become a member of European Union. What is your attention to these plans and what benefits and problems to European Union in common and to European economy will bring this new member? Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's a very, I mean, it's a very difficult question for me to answer. The experience of the members became, uh, of new members in joining the European Union is by and large uh, successful. Uh, when I said before, incidentally, I just want to touch on another point. I said I don't want to sound complacent. Uh, if, we, if, I, if I were to say that, uh, for example, for, for countries like, we call it stress countries, Italy, Fran Italy, Spain, and so on, to be in the euro is a fantastic success today, they would look at me with, uh, at least to say, the skeptical eye. Um, the unemployment is very high, and uh, youth unemployment is especially high. And then the, uh, the issue is, is it fault of the euro, or do we, are there other causes to that? And uh, if we look at that, we see that two things explain. I mean, we had unemployment. In the UK, you had unemployment. By, by and large as much as we had in the rest of the euro area, but it was not especially concentrated in the young sector of the population. Uh, what explains the high level of youth unemployment in Spain and Italy, for example, is what I've read this morning in the Financial Times, when these two countries rank last in uh, education. So basically, the skills that uh, have been taught are not the ones that are being useful to, be, to get a job. Um, and then there is another reason would explain why, for example, in France, youth unemployment is also high, even though France has a good educational system. And uh, this has to do with the legislation that's been introduced at the beginning of the year 2000s in all these countries. In order to make the labor market more flexible, they, these governments, had uh, introduced flexibility through in the way of short-term contracts, three months, even one month in Spain, um, in, uh, only for the young, only for the new entrants, and at the same time protected everybody else. So millions of jobs were created, and then as soon as the crisis struck, the first jobs to be cut were the jobs of the young people. So that's the second answer. There is a wrong type of legislation which has put the weight 
of labor flexibility only upon the young. So these are the two. I'm sorry I didn't answer to Ukraine. Uh, I, I think, so I, I'm optimistic. I don't know much about this. I'm optimistic that, uh, that certainly Ukraine and the, on one hand will benefit from this and also the European Union will benefit from this. But uh, please uh, forgive me, but I don't know much about this. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. We're very, 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 very,